what extent has online killed the professional salon or clinic business? Mark, over to you first on that one. Thank you. Um, so has it? No, it absolutely hasn't because um, after all, the skin center, the salon business is about human connection. Uh, it's about touch. And that uh, fortunately can't be replaced by online. So I don't think it really has. But of course, we can't ignore um, we can't ignore that uh, the, uh, the consumer behavior changes and the skin sensors need to change with it. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with Mark that it certainly hasn't killed uh, the salons um, in any way, shape or form. Uh, but I think that the, you know, the jury's still out on long-term effect on salons uh, where you see some uh, some of the manufacturers, some of the brands shifting focus away from the value that they add in salon yeah. uh, to chase, you know, a bigger opportunity in the consumer space. So that's, you know, it just remains to be seen what happens there. Mm. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, I mean, we're seeing that from a trade show organizer as well, where you see some of our traditional kind of professional brands um, kind of changing tack, and especially over the pandemic, you see much more of that. So, I mean, what's your take on? Um, I mean, I, I look after our indie operations, and you know, when I talk to you know the big brands that come via their distribution channel, you know, we're all very kind of, um, and some of these are large skin brands, large hair brands, that obviously during the pandemic we all had to survive, but some of them really dropped their values, and you know, were everywhere. So, hardcore professional brands were all over e-commerce. Um, every retail store just essentially uh, essentially dumping stock just to you know ensure cash flow survived and mm -hmm. you know but we, we had some brands that were very like we're not going to take that easy route out because once this is over we've still got to go and face our professional customer um, so you know what, what's your kind of viewpoint around that I'll, I'll go to you Mark first because that, that's a big you know, even for you know Dermalogica that's a big one to kind of balance the, the value of Dermalogica as a brand comes through the use in a skin center, so we, we definitely we wouldn't we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the skin center. We're very very aware of that of that heritage, and we want to keep it that way because without that, we'd we're, we're just any other skincare brand. So uh, we did not dump prices. We sold online, yes, because it was a question of survival. Yeah. But we also trained uh, salon owners in using their social media setting up online consultations and they became very good at it and some of the salon owners made more money during covid than they did before just by talking to their customers through their through their social media and i think one of the key learnings here is how are we going to continue to communicate with the consumers and the or the customers or the clients um, through those medias where they are so that we can keep that dialogue going and use the media use online to get clients into the skin centers and some uh, of our our customers some of our b2b customers are incredibly good at that now yeah I think we'll probably want to get more into that you know as we get into the conversation but you know in essence how are you going to maintain that balance of okay Dumb Logic was a hardcore professional brand, you know, very education focused, you know, very much about the, the therapist. And, you know, I know Mary, you know, I know friends who are Dumb Logic therapists and they're so kind of passionate about we will never use anything else. You know, they're hardcore, you know, um, evangelic essentially about it. Um, while you've seen other global peers really kind of switch, you know, because they're looking at the bigger number that, you know, the, the D to C, the B to C number is, you know, X, X times. So how are you going to maintain that tricky balance? Because um, you know, especially now that you're, you know, you're run by, you know, essentially, you know, FMCG kind of heartbeat is, you know, running the operation. How are you going to maintain that balance? First of all, they don't actually run the ob oh, operation. Oh, sorry, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they, we, we have owners that are very, very uh, uh, aware that we are a different different brand. We have a different way route to consumer than the uh, FMCG. So that that's not really an issue. But um, how are we going to adapt? How are we going to find the balance yes. in speaking directly to the consumer and uh, and getting you know a healthy salon skin center business? And we are very, very aware of that. And it is a fine balance because it's about two things. It's about talking to the consumers, but it's also about gaining the trust from the salons that you are actually, uh, that you want the best for them. And we truly, honestly, we live and breathe to come up with ideas to help them to survive. Because if they weren't there, we wouldn't be there.
Uh, so it, it's really that simple. Um, and we have, uh, I think we'll talk about that later, but we aff affiliation of our online sales goes directly to the, to the salons, and that's something they should be taking much more use of because we actually want to give customers clients to the salons. We don't want to take them from them. We want to give them to them. 85% of, of uh, the population have never had a skin treatment, have never had a facial treatment. So there's so much to go for out there. There's so much business. We can be growing and growing and growing for years to come. And that's just not just for Optimologica, that's for the whole industry. Great. It sounds a bit like what, you know, what Ke you know the panelists before were talking about, were, and Keith especially, because as a small salon owner, you know, it's what his value is, and he can keep driving that. And it sounds like because the, the founders are still heavily involved, they're really still driving the ethos and the kind of values and the DNA of Dermalogica. So that's how you're trying to still maintain that that balance. Um, Samuel, over to you because obviously you're you know you're you know a you know a large distributor of you know multi category. So how are you kind of maintaining that balance? Yeah, well, um, th most of the brands that we import, we distribute uh, and educate uh, for the professional. Um, Obviously, we have minimal, or we have some level of influence, but not necessarily control over. Um, and so what we have to do is make sure that we're true to our ethos uh, and our core principles, which is serving the professional. So we spend time picking and choosing and researching the brands uh, that we feel will do that. Because, may, you know, the world is a changing place now, and I think you guys both use the word finding the balance. You know, balance is the, the key operative word here. But I, I believe that you're, I believe ultimately you've got to have a customer in mind. You know, you serve the professional, you serve the salon, uh, and what you do does that, serving the salon professional, or you're serving, you know, the, your end target is the consumer. And you can, you can have gray and you can have blending of both, uh, but ultimately, I think you've got to like pick a lane and you've got to drive down hard in that lane if you want to, um, if you want to come out on top. And I think Dermalogica's history, for one, has always been rooted in uh, the professional. Uh, and as it's grown and it's evolved, it's maintained those roots. Uh, but still, there is that also that need to be able to support the salon and support the professional uh, through exposure, through PR, through accessibility. But it's a very fine line to walk. And if I believe, I believe that if professionals feel like you're starting to change your focus from them, and that was your commitment, that was your the reason that you existed, to then their customers, then I feel like you, they're, they're, you kind of, there's a disjointment that comes about of that. And uh, professionals will have a tendency to start to look for brands they can identify with that stay in a lane uh, and that they can, they can drive along with. So I guess my point being that, you know, we, we, we're dedicated to the professional. First and foremost, that's what we do. We do have brands that will support some level of um, you know, e-commerce and, and availability for those brands, and that's important because accessibility is important. Uh, but what is Im the most important to us is making sure that you know you don't try to change the customer that you're servicing. Uh, going back to the, the balance phrase again, like how have you maintained your balance? Because um, you know, like we were talking about the brand level, there were brands that were changing strategy. Some of it was, you know, uh, because of the pandemic and they're just trying to survive. Some of it have now looked at longer trends and kind of changing their models and their focus from professional to kind of the bigger kind of uh, direct, you know, B2C kind of model. So you would have brands, I'm sure, that kind of have swayed or kind of whether it was short term, whether you can see long term changes. So how do you maintain your balance as a kind of distributor of key brands where some of your principles are changing tack? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think that um, we focus on the brands of service of professional and during the pandemic, obviously our customers were radically affected because they weren't allowed to, to work. So, you know, we did uh, programs, you know, drop shipping for our customers, selling on behalf of our customers uh, and, and supporting those kinds of um, um, processes and also some level of e-com uh, for those products that complemented the brand and complemented 
uh, uh, the experience. That's what we, we focus on, but we didn't actually change our customer. We didn't change our model in any way, shape, or form. We battened down just like our customers did. Yeah. Uh, what, what about the brand through. level, like you know, the brands you're working with? Because some of them you might have think, they're not really, you know, they're swaying from your core principles and your values to your customer. So I'm sa essentially saying, you know, are there brands that were pivoting and you thinking, do they still fit within your portfolio of like where you're going? Well, that's a good question. I, I can't think of any brands that have particularly changed, uh, changed lanes uh, that, that, that we represent in any way, shape or form. Um, everything we do is still 100% for the professional. So, um, you know, some of the brands that we do have a high componentry of uh, retail products, some of the hair brands that we do, uh, but we haven't changed our tact with that in any way, shape or form. Okay, super. I think also, it's, you know, in it, in, if you're operating in an omni-channel model, um, use all those channels to talk about what you're about. So our business is education, educating uh, professionals, educating the consumer and skin health. So, for instance, when we go into a John Lewis and we don't do services there, we put pictures of people having a treatment there. So, immediately when the customer sees that, and even if they that day only buy the product, they will have that little seed in their brain. This product is about getting treatments, and ultimately one day they will have that treatment. That is the philosophy, and that is how we want to go about it. We use our online not just to sell product, which is of course important, but to educate about getting skin treatments, to get them into skin sensors, and it works. We give out vouchers so that they, the customers that never had a treatment get a voucher, and they have that first treatment, and then they get rebooked and rebooked and rebooked. It's, it's hard work, but it's sort of, it works. Yeah. And, and I, I want to go back to the point you mentioned at the beginning because you know it's easy when we think online that online means e-commerce and e-commerce means Amazon. It's that, you know you kind of have that extrapolation, and that's really going to kill you know our industry if we're looking at retail and products, etc. But you know you move back to saying you know online is just it's you you kind of went back to saying it's a communication tool as well. So essentially you're pivoting back to it's not just e-commerce, but it's a way of communicating. And you've seen some of your salons, you know, like you said doubling you know, their revenues, you're saying, during that time because they, they understood how to use this and weren't scared or threatened by it. So you know, just you know, kind of elaborate a bit more around you know, you know, what yes. is happening so there. So the, there's sort of two kinds of salons right now. There's the one that, said, that says, that is, this is not why I joined uh, uh, you know, the business. I want to do skin treatments. I don't want to hear about online. And that's very dangerous because the world sort of moves on anyway and uh, I, it, it saddens me a little bit when I hear that because it's a little bit like you've given up and you just want to focus on yours. Uh, and then there's the other part who really engages with, uh, with the modern world, with, with the tools that are available. So it's almost like wh whether you think it's going to kill your business or whether you think you'll survive, you'll be right because you're going to choose that lane and you're going to start to work, uh, work on that and, and you, can, uh, you can certainly win. And yeah, I think that to like salons um, pick, pick a brand. They have, like first and foremost, my in my experience, and obviously these are all generalizations, uh, but generally speaking, a, a, a professional will pick a brand because they can they can hook, they can attach um, something of value onto that brand. So uh, Dermalogica, it's the education and the commitment to education. You know, that's what they want to be able to do. Plus they recognize they have experience in it. It's quality. They know professionals will see that as quality. So they can place like a hook on it and connect with it. Uh, and first and foremost, so, uh, professionals are pr predominantly interested in uh, selling their services, selling themselves. And that's why that connection with the brand is so pivotal and so important. And the principles of what that brand stands for is critical because if that changes lanes, then you know that could become decoupled from what you know the professional chose that brand for in the first place. So it is a little bit of a conundrum because um, professionals attach themselves to a brand for a particular reason and a lot of that is about selling themselves and selling their services. And, but at the same time, a lot of brands will have a retail component where they use that as a communication tool, PR and profile building tool, which benefits the professional. Um, but, you know, and the brands like, come on, you know, let's, let's, let's retail, let's promote this, let's all work together to make a bigger brand. And a lot are doing exactly what you're saying. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in kind of keeping it for myself. This is my brand, this represents me. So it is a bit of a conundrum and that's always been the conundrum I think within that professional space. Uh, and that's why it just requires some, 
some balance about your approach to um, amplifying the retail portion, the B2C portion of, 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 of what you're doing. Because it can disrupt your your core audience or your base audience of professionals. Yeah, and and what, what kind of work you know are you doing with your kind of you know professional clients in terms of helping them adapt to the online world, adapt to kind of retailing online, you know, which we would like. I know you said you kind of had the dropship model to help them during the pandemic, but you know, how are you helping you? Know, are there ways that you can help your salon that, and then you're doing that? Well, we have some programs that we're doing uh, that uh, I, 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 I can't go into right now that were um, uh, to be able to support them better. But um, but other than the drop shipping uh, on behalf of our, our customers, there's not a lot that we're doing other than working with them and trying to help them up their game in the retail space. Uh, and more importantly, right now for us, it's about uh, supporting them in rebuilding their business post COVID. Um, which is their priority right now, uh, is not necessarily retail or amplifying the retail. It's about how do I start getting, um, how do I start touching people again, yep. you know, by bringing them back into the salon so I can perform the services because their priority is about services. conducting <clears throat> those services. Yeah. So that's been our focus and priority right now. Okay. And then? I, I actually feel like saying first and foremost, the, the salon owners should focus on selling products to the customers and the clients they actually have right in front of them because they have 60 minutes or more mm. if it's a it's a hairdresser with the client if they haven't used that time to try and sell them some products they've not done their job and what you would find is that a lot of the people complaining about online sales have not even tried to sell that product probably a little bit more a problem in in skincare than it is in hair maybe but they they're a little bit introverted and they don't they don't want to know they 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 might think you know if you work in a skin center products are expensive maybe you can't even af afford the product you're you're selling but you need to remove those barriers and actually use those 60 minutes to inform the, the client about the, the, the products. So when it comes to then online, there's lots they can do. Some of them have their own website. Some of them maintain that. We, uh, we've set up a, uh, what we call it the digital partner program. But we actually just say, if you don't have the time to do that, because running a website today, running a, a, an e-com site is a huge job. It's a full-time job. And you're trying to run your skin sensor and your daughter is running your social media and your husband is running your ego. I mean, this is all quite complex. And yes, you could do that 10 years ago. But if you, if you, if you want to run a modern site, forget all about that and, and let someone that knows how to run a site run the site. And we then give the commission back to that client, not just as a one-off, but as an ongoing thing. Um, uh, and uh, we're seeing more and more take up on this because really they don't want to be in their garage packing products every time they're off. They want to be treating customers and use the time to communicate with the, with the client is uh, as, as, uh, as much, much better. And, and I, I think that this model that, uh, that you guys have done is, is absolutely the, the way forward. Uh, because it does satisfy the the need for accessibility within uh, the clients and the professionals. Again, they want to be focusing on on selling themselves. They don't want to feel like they're just going through a sales pitch uh, to be able to sell retail. That the customer, uh, a large portion of the customers, are going to walk out and just Google it and buy it online, buy it from Amazon for cheaper. Um, and, and I think there's an apathy within the, the salon base where they go, why should I do that? Because the customer is just going to buy it online for cheaper. And I think that if you can take that concern off the shelf, off the table, so you can say, you're absolutely right. You do the work. You sell it to the, the professional through your, or to the customer through your services, through your professionalism, and through educating the, cu the customer. You, you're damn straight you should get the benefit and the reward from that. So as long as you're ensuring that that's set up and they can benefit from that, uh, I think that is, the, that is the sweet spot for being able to ensure full accessibility uh, for, uh, uh, for, for clients and consumers moving forward uh, and also rewarding and taking care of the professional um, for doing the job, which is converting that client onto that brand in the first place. So I think it's key. I think you said another key word there, Samuel. You said rewarding because there's also a huge trend in supporting your, your local skin center, your local salon. People want their local businesses to survive and they should use that tool. They should 
they should talk to the client about that. Tell them that, you know, I really appreciate if you buy this product with me because actually it helps me survive. It removes the, the focus on price as well. And it's, it's almost like a tipping culture. If you had a good experience, you want to support that business, you want to buy that product with them. And it's, it's n not more complicated than just say that and ask them. And you'll find that a lot of, um, a lot of, of, of clients just buy the product there and they don't ask uh, for a discount. We, we, we've done some training, we selected some skin sensors and did some training with them on this. And immediately overnight, within any investment, in any advertising, they were 28% up on their retail, just overnight. Some, some of them uh, called me back and said, I've sold five times more pro uh, product in a month than I usually sell, just by, by saying these words. Um, so it, it's a lot about thinking about your own business and uh, about the communication, much more than the bigger, big bad wolf internet uh, stealing your business. Yeah. Well, and, and just, to, just to round that off, I mean, if we think about our, um, the, the professionals, they build their business based on touch and based on the relationship. Uh, and the client is part of that relationship. So if the client is given the option, given the choice, and you take away the friction and the barriers, you bet your butt they're, they're going to do whatever they can to buy the product to support the salon. But, you know, as, as it so happens, they're not going to run out of shampoo or conditioner or creams or whatever right at the same time they're going to the salon. So you need to remove those barriers, and if they can get the product online, they know that the salon's gonna benefit from it. Uh, I, I think they'd pay a premium for it, for one. Uh, I think they'd go out of their way to be able to do that. Because again, they're going in and they're spending time face to face, eye to eye with that person that they're benefiting, or they know if they go somewhere else, they're taking away from. So I think that's, uh, that's the critical way to be able to move forward. Uh, and I think it ensures that you keep to the core purpose on your original lane, which is you're doing everything you can to support the professional, if that was the lane you chose. How, how much is that possible for, um, you know, because at, at brand level, you know, you know, Mark and the team can really run that and they can have a lot more control and more support and talk to the customers. But from a distributor point of view, and especially running multi, you know, multi brand portfolio, you know, how much is that kind of feasible for you as well to look at how you support your professionals in a similar kind of concept? Oh, it's totally doable. Uh, absolutely doable, and in some ways, it, it, in some ways, it's a little bit easier if you've got a broader range of uh, of premium products to be able to work with. Uh, in some ways, it's a little bit more difficult. So you're trading some positive pros and some cons. Uh, so it's definitely it's not as easy as if you are the brand, uh, but uh, it's still you know it's still something that um, uh, is of great value and uh, and something we're looking into. Okay. Um. Then um, the the other kind of thing we have, you know, with salons challenging. You know, when you know, for example, the kind of strategy you've adopted, and I and I saw now India market. You know, a lot of the the distributors doing very similar kind of strategy, and you know, and even global brands we talk to about really how do they support the professional to stay afloat during the pandemic? You know, doing the drop ship, um, so helping them with their helping them with their websites and their e-commerce, and saying, okay, you're going to get commission for every sale that goes through. Um, but when I also was talking to salon clients uh, in our local market, a lot of the salons were like, we're never going to do that because, you know, you know, the brand will come in, you know, if we give them our, our email list or our customer database, yes, that you, we may get a one off, but how can we trust them really in the long term to, to not just go direct to our customer and cut us out of, of that equation? So, you know, what's your take on that? Because that, that is a real insecurity, you know, for, for the salon and especially with, I mean, I mean, we're painting Amazon as a big bad wolf in the room, but you know, if they're trying to control more and more, and we look at e-commerce as this big bad wolf, um, how much of that you know insecurity do you see filtering through to you at brand level? I think there's a lot of that. It's a huge barrier, and uh, it's about trust. And of course, uh, I mean, I have. 5,000 skin centers, so I can't visit them one by one myself and sort of build that trust. But I think if they truly understand your strategy, a little bit like Samuel said, you've chosen that path of supporting professional skin centers. They, they then need to understand that if you don't do that, they will not survive and then your business model is gone. I mean, wh why would I remove skin centers that are the lifeblood of my business? So that's the first thing. So the next thing on a practical level, how do you then do that? We, we try to capture 
those uh, clients that, that want to support in three different ways. So they, if, even if they forget to use the link that they've been given, we capture, the, capture them on cookies, and if they have, have a new mobile or they clear the cookies, we capture them on email to link them back to that skin center. So we really try to do everything, and even if, if that still doesn't work, and the and the salon calls me and says, actually, that customer bought and they now live in another city and I didn't get my commission. I'll make sure that they get that commission because they deserve it. That's so we stretch quite far to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that answers your question of how you build that trust. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think people are cynical uh, about brands selling direct to, to, um, uh, to, you know, cons to, co to consumers. Uh, and I think rightly so. Uh, but I think that if the brand trusts you because you deliver value, I think they're going to be open to trust you. And I think if you're communicative and you go uh, out of your way to inform your customers of what's happened, so they're seeing uh, passive transactions taking place uh, even after the fact, I think that reaffirms their trust in you because you're not going to use a brand you don't trust in the first place uh, because, again, that is what your brand as a salon or a treatment provider is built on. So, you know, I guess the, I guess the risk is that uh, if you do go down the path, you give them a one-off sell and then you don't do it after that or you don't make all of your efforts to try to support them after the fact, you will lose their trust. And I think that they'll feel lied to. And if the customer and the client feels lied to, then they're going to be looking for another brand. So... But the, the first time I had a telephone call from a salon owner that was sat by a swimming pool in Mallorca and, and saw that, that sale come in when she wasn't there, that was a good moment because she was sort of like, ooh, I can make money actually not being in my salon. Sitting and in the pool. Sat, sitting by the pool. <laughs> okay, it's not as extreme as that, but it, it, it was just is, like, is oh, the system actually works. That's how much commission they're making off the devological sales. I, I, well, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping they have some clients too. How do I start selling Dermalogic? How do I get one of these affiliate codes? Yeah. Uh, um, well, on, on the flip of that, then, how do you then, because um, I've seen, you know, we've seen other markets where, sa you know, some of the salon customers can suddenly become big e-tailers, um, you know, and some of their model changes because they suddenly start buying more and more, and they, you know, they've become e-tailers in, some, like I said, in the Indian market we look at, you get into the, into the borders of kind of grey market stuff as well, because there's stuff like diversion going on, so how do you also then control that balance where you've got the world of online and e-tailing and, you know, salons potentially you know, seeing that, like I said, you've got customers that have doubled their sales from, you know, retailing and, you know, e-tailing. Yeah, and, and we, we don't mind that they do that if they run a good site, if they're adding value for the client, if, they are, if they're doing it. If they just do it purely to discount the brand and just to sort of uh, leech, for in lack of a better word, on, on the brand value, we don't like it. But, of course, price fixing is illegal, so we can't do so much about it. But we are selective distribution brand, there's, so there's quite a lot, of, without getting too technical, you know, the site needs to look a certain way, they need to have certain elements on there, so if, if it's not a great site, we can close it down. But a lot of these sites are good, they have, they have their own little loyal client base, or sometimes quite big client base, um, and that's fine. Okay, great. Um, and how, how have you seen, because, um, you know, this whole, um, I mean, the whole, there's, there's online, but retailing has always been a challenge for, uh, and a stigma for the salon community and the professional community. And like you mentioned before, you know, there's those that say, we joined the industry 25 years ago to do services and touch and feel, and, you know, we were therapists or hairdressers, and that's what we love. And, you know, retailing is more of a salesperson's job, you know, and then you, you add on the extra layer on top of, you know, you know e-commerce and online. So, you know, what have you seen with your kind of, Know, professional clients um, that has an extra barrier to, to their success I don't know if I, 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 I don't know if I'd say that they see it they view it as a, an extra uh, or a barrier or a friction point I think they see it as a, a, an area of, of it, it depends on the professional and it depends on the area some are like um, understand the benefit of retail others like uh, like they run away from anything that would be perceived as selling anything other than themselves and the services. I think that the key thing here is for the professionals to understand the fact that they are selling product uh, through their processes and through their own brand and through the services they're doing and their customers are going to be utilizing or looking for those products they're going to extend their services, extend, enhance their treatments uh, they're going to be looking for it either in your salon or somewhere else. And you, and that's going to impact your work, whether it is, 
you know, the, the facials or whether it's hair color or your nails or whatever. And if you're not, if you're not providing those products that, the, that is going to enhance this, the treatment and that your customer is looking for, somebody else is going to, and that can actually have a detrimental effect on them. So I think that the key there is helping them understand the value that the retail adds to the customer's perception of the service they're providing. So that's key and that's pivotal. And the second bit is how just simply through retailing alone, not, you, you don't have to pay for any of your products. It's like your product's free. In fact, there's actually a premium. You get paid. If you can do some level of retailing, the affiliation program through uh, the Mark and Dermalogica are doing or other things like that, you, like your, that's all the more merrier it is for you. So you're enhance, you're you're taking care of your customers. The customers are getting the products that are going to enhance your service. Your services are going to look better, and the margins that you're going to receive either through you know online selling that you're getting some benefit for, or through selling within the retail section of the salon is going to more than cover the cost of your products that you use during servicing. And when you start to talk that language of like getting your products for free, then those that are not retail centric, but service centric, that seems to me anyway, to start to, to you know, flip some switches for, for, for professionals. Yeah, super. I mean, what, what so what, what do you, I mean, if we go back to the last question, you know, it was a kind of tongue in cheek one, like did on, is online killing the professional? So just from you know, what experience you're seeing where you've seen some professionals do well and you know you're really having to work hard to educate them about you've got to learn to retail and it's you're not a salesperson but it is part of your whole kind of supporting your customer so you know what you know what kind of if you could do one thing with the professional to really help them you know especially now they're trying to rebuild their businesses you know what are the kind of tips you would give them to so that this is what you've got to do to rebuild your business you know not be too worried about you know online and e-commerce you know what tips would you give Wow. Okay, that's a good question because it all it broadly it it really depends uh, on the type of salon and their emphasis and the benefit that retail is in their business model, and um, some some it's it's fairly substantial and some it's very small, but um, the most important tip right now is the connectivity. Uh, I think that largely not just our professionals but you know the the entire market. Uh, all of society has been relatively isolated um, uh, for the last couple of years. And our industry is an industry that's built on physical connectivity, the physical touching of people and spending, you know, 30 minutes or an hour or two hours with somebody in physical contact with them. And the one thing that uh, the pandemic has taken away from all of us is that constant touch. And where we're seeing the biggest uh, change is in uh, the activities and uh, the sessions uh, that we're doing where we're actually getting with our customers and in turn encouraging them to get with their customers and with the marketplace to remind people of that benefit that people get from experiencing their services, their treatments, the products that they're using. Um, we need to get people re-engaging again to reignite and rebuild that in the industry to a stronger industry, uh, which in turn has a positive effect on the retail aspects. So uh, right now, things are not f properly in balance. Uh, during the pandemic, everything shifted towards uh, uh, B2C, um, uh, focus on the retail, on uh, activities, and some brands will stay there and stick there and they've changed lanes and some had to some have to and there's you know no no judgment about that um but moving forward i think pendulum is going to to find that sweet spot and that balance point and it's about for us it's about supporting professionals all of these independent entrepreneurs uh that oftentimes are just one man bands uh trying to you know, trying to, to make it day to day or month to month and build um, a, a, a business that they're really proud of, connecting and touching people. And, um, and the retail is an important component of that and hopefully, um, you know, something that they'll, they'll continue to benefit from. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful reminder that, you know, our industry is very much about touch and feel and human connectivity. And, you know, that's what, you know, 
at least today, you know, online can't kind of replace that aspect. I mean, where we are in 10, 15 years from now, you know, with Meta and all that stuff, we have no idea. But at least right now, it's you have that kind of reminder that you know that's what we have to remind all of us that you know, online can't replace you know, the professional style right now. Um, anything you want to add to that, Mark? I think yeah, a lot's been said. I, 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 being reminded, you, you talked about customer experience, and I think if you, you need to, any business need to think about why should the client come to me? Don't start blaming everyone else. You know what, why are you why are you there? And I was out visiting uh, Blue Mango, uh, a, a skin center in southeast London, and she she gave out hugs when she because you realize people just been missing seeing each other so her 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 usp was i'm going to give you a huge hug uh, when when you come in she opened a cafe next to her she's she's uh, she's, she's got a full service she does nails hair uh, skin treatments massages everything she created an octopus treatment so that people that uh, are in the neighborhood can go and have their all they need done in one day. And you will have people working on your toes, your nails, your, your, your hair at the same time. Uh, and she's just an amazing entrepreneur that understands what the consumer, what the client needs. And you need to adapt to that. And she's got a huge online following. But it's about that, even, what happens even before you come? What's the communication like before you come? What's it like during? What's it like after? And then maybe we should, st when we talk about the consumers, the clients, we should stop talking about selling because selling is really quite, it's not modern. You want to help the, the, the client get the best experience possible. And that sort of removed that whole, you know, there's nothing worse than when you take them to the retail bay after the treatment. <laughs> they know that, oh, now they're going to start selling. So I'm always programmed to say no, even if I want to buy. So use the time that you have with the client to talk about the product, not at the end, because it's so obvious that you're going to be sold to. So build it into your service and talk about what benefit you're going to get when you come home if you use this product. Put it aside, take it to the till at the end and say, do you have any of these products already? Instead of starting to ask, do you want to buy this and it costs 80 pounds and you want to buy this, it's called for, it's boring. It's very boring and it's very price focused. Talk about the benefit. Yeah. Can I, and I just add that, that the, and the only way that you're going to drive that kind of behavior um, is through ensuring that they are recognized with a reward and acknowledgement for doing that after that client leaves the salon. So again, uh, applaud you guys on your model and your approach to that because it does do that. And that will reinforce that behavior. If they don't receive that kind of acknowledgement uh, after the, and reward after the fact, uh, then there's no reason for them to, to have that behavior of thinking about selling the brands or the products. And they'll look for brands that will take care of them. So I think it's a long-term um, long win is them. So. Yeah. Again, the practical kind of advice, and I think really getting to the heart of the question, which you know isn't about has online killed the professional start. You're right. The ones that think they have have, but really about it, it's in, in the short term. You know, online cannot replace the human connect and the professional. And you know, and I think we've you know the brands and the the businesses that and the tissues that understand that. You know, and the salons that understand that, and the clinics that understand that. You know, will continue to f to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and not be worried about you know evolution. So you know, thank you very much for your tips and advice.